Nothing happening on my blood. <laughs> <laughs> Just different colors. There's no clumping now? Uh, there's something on anti D on the third one. It has all the yellow around it. No. Do any of you know your actual blood type to compare it to? I am O positive. You're all yeah. positive. Okay, so you're only going to get clumping in that third well, Juliet. I have a card. I'm going to go check it and see if it's the same as what <laughs> I just found out. All right. And you said to put the plastic over it? Yeah, once it's, once it's dried, yep. You can go ahead okay. and peel that plastic off and go ahead and put it over it. So it doesn't doesn't get on anything or whatever. It's, um, it's the strong versus like typical, typical ag um, aggregate or agulinate, whatever they say in this chart in the back of the paper. Is that just based on the sample or does it have something to do with the quality of your blood or? Um, no, it doesn't have anything to do with the quality of your blood. Just just based on your your sample. Um, yeah, it's, it's just based on you know whether or not you've contaminated anything or or some people have less of the antigen. Like if you have certain types of anemia, you would have certain less. You would have less red blood cells, and you would have less of these uh, antigens. So it might give you a lesser reaction, mm -hmm. but it's not really the quality of the blood. Okay. So Melissa, you said yours was the same? Yes, A positive. Cool. A positive, awesome. So I'm just opening up the PowerPoint. Um, if only the third one clumps, that's O positive, you said? Right, so okay. the, third, right. the third one yeah. tells you whether it's positive or negative. Okay. And the first okay. is, is for A, the second is for B. So if you don't have anything for A and you don't have anything for B, then you're O. Yep. And, okay. and then positive. So actually O is one of the most common blood types. I was gonna say, don't they always ask for people to donate that because they can utilize that with anybody? They can give it to anyone? Sort of. O, o negative is technically the universal donor. Um, oh, okay. O positive could donate to a lot of people and we'll, we'll cover that today in lecture. Um, that's a, always where it gets a little, uh, People get a little confused on that, but um, yes, they. If you donate through the Red Cross, they'll they'll keep hounding you. Like, oh, eight weeks are up. You can donate again. You know. yeah. you, I oh, haven't oh. donated to them in years because the last person she, I don't know if she was like in training, but I've never had an issue, and I donated all the time because my father, before he passed, needed a lot of blood transfusion. Like he needed a lot at one point, so I was always donating, and my whole arm from like shoulder to wrist was like bruised. It was yellow. Oh, no. She just kept searching and I was like, why don't we try the other arm? <laughs> like, I hate when they put the needle on, they start they needle in yeah. and they start moving it around. It's like, no, 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 no. This is no <laughs> but yeah, it looked like the bruise. Like I was bruised throughout my whole arm from like here to here. It was crazy. That was the last time I donated. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, so I, I got married in 2005, and I remember thinking, mm -hmm. oh, we're going to have to go and get blood tests, and we didn't. You don't anymore. And it was only, like, very recently before we got married that you didn't have to do that anymore. And was that yep. the RH factor, I assume, because they assume that you're going to have, then have children? Right, exactly. Okay. So <laughs> it's basically, if you, um, when you go to the doctor, when you, you know, they confirm that you're pregnant, if you are RH negative, they automatically start giving you Rogam. Like, they don't care if you tell them who the father is. They, they don't want to know. If you're RH negative and they know that the, the father's RH negative as well, they don't want to hear it. They just, they, they just assume give you Rogan. 
Um, and we'll talk about that today too, what that, what that is and what that means. Um, but yeah, I was surprised. I got married in uh, 2015 and, and they don't, they don't ask for blood type or blood tests anymore. They didn't in 2005 either. Yeah. I mean, I guess it doesn't matter, right? There's, yeah. there's plenty of people that have children that are not married and. You know, I don't know why that was a thing that I was expecting. It was, it's just kind of funny. Like, I don't know yeah. why that was just like inherent that I knew that. Well, probably, you probably heard it from like your parents. Probably, or, but it was just assumed like, oh, then we're going to have to get our blood test. Yeah. So, yep. Um, can I ask something? Can I? Sure. So on, um, on the third circle, mm -hmm. the blood, um, it's like a uh, solid in the middle. Is that mm -hmm. what it's supposed to? It can be uh, the third circle because it's the RH antibody. It can be a little bit, a little bit finicky, a little bit funky, and sometimes it doesn't look like the first two. Um, so sometimes you'll get a big clump. Now, if you're if you're O positive, yeah. then that means you, you you should get a clump in that third circle. So it's yeah, hard to say whether it's just you know you didn't stir it as much as the others, or or if it's just you know just the way it looks. Yeah, nothing happens with the three. It's just like a red paint. They're all even except the yep. third one. Is there so anybody like, besides O and, and A? Melissa's A. Anybody else get anything different? I was just going to ask you about A, B, but now I'm looking at this chart again. So I think I, think I, I just got A. That is another type, A, B, right? AB is another type. Yep. So you would have, you have clumping in the first well and clumping in the second well. And that's a universal recipient, right? Yes. Okay. Right. So my, my, my wife is actually AB positive, which is, is rare and is, yeah. can receive blood from anybody, which is really cool. Yeah. I mean, cool for her. I watched a YouTube video before it started and it said that I didn't realize that before. Yep. I yeah, think I had it backwards that O was more rare. I yeah, had no. It backwards, yeah. Yep. O is actually really common. O and A are the two most common blood types wow. in this part of the world. Oh, well, um, that's good. <laughs> I don't know that they necessarily are like in other parts of the world. But in this, in this hemisphere, right, in the Western part of the world, they're the most common. Do we need to hold on to these? I think I ruined mine. <laughs> When I tried to put the plastic on, it wasn't fully dry, and now oh, no. my <laughs> bubbles are blending. You don't need to hold on to them. No, I was going to ask you guys to take a picture of it and upload it. Um, you don't need to. It's okay. <laughs> Might be able to salvage it. Oh, did anybody listen to uh, Nikki Giovanni? Was that last night? Sixth. I think it might be tonight. Oh, is it tonight? The seventh? Maybe, yeah. Let's see. I think that's what I saw. Oh, yeah, April 7th at 6 p.m. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't do 6 p.m. because that's dinner time and bath time with little kids. That's a crazy time at our house, but you know. <laughs> she's, um, she's a very dynamic speaker. She's not boring, you know, it's not one of these. It's kind of like if you've ever watched any like TED Talks, you guys ever watched TED Talks? Um, they're usually short and they're very, uh, very dynamic speakers, not anything boring. You know, they, they, they do this really well. And there's a reason that they're chosen for these speeches. Um, and I don't know exactly what she's going to speak on tonight, but I know that uh, April 16th is when the shootings happened. So that's coming up next week. Uh, and I, it's hard to believe that it was that many years ago. It was what, 2007? Seven. Yeah. yeah. So, so she's, she's an amazing speaker. Um, I've only heard it that one time, but I, I certainly remember that speech and everything. Hopefully it'll be recorded and posted somewhere. Yeah, that would be cool. Six o'clock is crazy at my house too. <laughs> yeah. 
Yep. <laughs> I feel like that's a bad time. Like it is. <laughs> dinner, like with us, we're you know it's dinner, then cleaning up, and then baths, and trying to get the kids to bed. And everything. I have teenagers and a five-year-old, and it's like both needy, both age groups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. My my <laughs> older daughter is um is fourteen, and so she's yep. gonna have soccer practice and and softball practice. And yeah, we're in the same boat then. <laughs> She actually had remote learning today because they, um, in Connecticut, they, uh, they had the teachers get vaccinated, like they had special clinics for the, the K through 12 teachers. And there was something like 30 teachers at her school that were getting their second vaccination yesterday. So they did a remote day today, knowing yeah. that most of them would be sick. That was our school last week. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, my son Friday is remote because they're using their school as a. Oh, vaccination. as a center. Sure. Yep. Yep. Cool. Now, did the did the mass did the Massachusetts governor do, um, the kind of like the Connecticut governor governor did it by age range basically, like the the seventy five and up got it first, and then it opened up to sixty five and up, and then fifty five, and kept pushing it back. Um, and there were, you know, obviously healthcare workers were in there and, and teachers were in there. Is that how Massachusetts did it? Or is it just like first come, first serve? It was healthcare workers at first and employees and, and um, 65 and older. Uh -huh. And then it was, it was also then age based. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So it sounds like the same kind of wave system. Yeah. It seemed mm -hmm. to work pretty well. I think we might be down to like, if you have one health condition now, you can get it if you're not 65. Oh, in Connecticut, it opened up April 1st. I think it opened up to anybody 16 and older who wanted it. If you can get a, you know, if you can get a site and an appointment, a, a time or whatever. I got a call from the DP, the Department of Health today that if we had any new residents who were 65 or older, mm -hmm. didn't mention any sort of health problems or anything that they would have to come to our facility to give the doses. Oh, okay. That was just today. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. All right. So any questions on the blood typing stuff as far as the procedure of it? And we're going to talk about this in lecture and we'll talk about the, uh, what it means, what those dots actually mean and all that kind of thing. But are there any questions on the procedure stuff? Okay. And let's go ahead with the lecture. Now these, these next couple of weeks are kind of crazy with the cardiovascular system. There's a lot to learn. Um, there's a lot to cover, but we'll get through it. And I, what I'm going to try to do for next week is, um, so whenever I teach the hearts, the first thing I do is draw on the board with red and blue marker. Um, to kind of get you guys used to the blood flow through the heart. And so I'm gonna to try to do that for next week on, on the whiteboard uh, part of this app. Um, hopefully, hopefully I can get that to work well enough to do that. But today we are going to um, talk about the blood, talk about a few other aspects of the uh, cardiovascular system. So any questions before we get started? I have a question just because my daughter came in. If sure. I'm O positive, and I think that me and her father are the same, would she then be O positive as well? Um, let's let me think. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's, right? it's, it's good because it's a universal donor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, that, Welcome. <laughs> yes. All right, so here we are with chapter 11, the blood. And the way this works, chapter 11 is the blood, chapter 12 is the heart, and chapter 13 is the blood vessels, right? So we'll go through the blood, we'll understand that first, and then um, I'll start, I may even start actually tomorrow diagramming the heart a little bit, because that, to me, chapter 12 takes a little bit longer, the heart. Um, the blood is not that long of a chapter, but there are, there are some big points to go through. So the learning outcomes, here's your, your cardiovascular system introduction. Um, the blood is the body's internal transport network, right? So 
the blood is actually how you transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. It's how you transport hormones. It's how you transport nutrients. You get nutrients from the foods you eat. Those get transported through your blood. Um, waste products get transported through your blood. So there are all these different things. So it's, it's really pretty important to understand what the blood is and how it works. Um, so functions, right? It transports dissolved gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. That's what we think of usually when we think of red blood cells but also nutrients. Anything that you eat or drink gets into your bloodstream. So any nutrients that you're getting from your food, any vitamins, things like glucose and proteins, all those things get through your bloodstream. Hormones. Hormones are just messengers, right? And we did a whole chapter on the endocrine system and the pituitary gland and how it secretes hormones into your bloodstream. They travel throughout your bloodstream. And metabolic waste. Um, those are waste products from things that you eat, right? So sometimes when you eat things, you break them down, your body breaks them down, and it can utilize part of what's broken down, but part of it is just a waste product, and that gets excreted um, generally, you know, through your, your urine, through the kidneys, it gets excreted. It also regulates interstitial fluid pH and ion composition. So we'll get into that a little bit. Anybody know about what the pH of your blood is? 7.4? Yep, 7.4, 7.3, 7.4, somewhere in there, just above, just alkaline compared to neutral, right? Neutral is seven, so it's just above seven. Um, so you're regulating the, the fluid pH. Um, we'll see that it's closely related, your blood is closely related to the respiratory system. And so you take carbon dioxide and you dissolve it in the blood and that helps to regulate the pH. Also the ion composition, right? How, many, how much sodium is there? How much chlorine is there? How much potassium is there? All of that's regulated in your blood. Um, it restricts fluid loss at injury sites. So we'll, we'll see um, how blood clots form. And the big reason blood clots form is to stop any fluid loss. Um, defend against toxins and pathogens. All the white blood cells, all the information on the white blood cells is that they're defending your body. Um, they are also circulating through your blood and stabilizes body temperature. That's one that we don't always think about. Your, think about this. What's your core body temperature? What's the body temperature at your center? 98.6. 98.6, good. So there's a condition where people have poor blood circulation. It's called Raynaud's syndrome. And in that syndrome, what happens is the blood does not circulate often enough from your core to your extremities. And people with Raynaud's syndrome often have really cold fingers and toes. And it's because of poor circulation. It's because the blood is not going often enough to the core where it's really warm and bringing that temperature back out to the extremities. Um, so it does have a lot to do, or not a lot, but it does have to do with your body temperature and stabilizing your body temperature. You can take the blood and split it into two groups. You can split what's in the blood into plasma and formed elements. Right? The plasma is always the liquid part and everything that's dissolved in the liquid. And we'll talk about that in a second. The formed elements are the solids. And so they are the cells and the cell fragments. And what that is, is red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. Platelets are cell fragments and they're involved in blood clotting. So just over half of your volume of blood is, is plasma, is liquid, and just under half is the solids. The blood volume varies by age and body size. Um, males average a little bit more blood per, uh, per their whole body than females, and that's just, just because of body size, just because males tend to be bigger. On average, males are bigger. Characteristics of blood. The temperature is 38 Celsius, slightly above body temperature. So we think of body temperature as 37 degrees Celsius. Blood's a little bit warmer. Um, it is five times more viscous than water. It's thick, right? It's not, it, it's not runny like water. It's slightly alkaline, right? 7.35 to 7.45. And, and blood is a connective tissue. If you think back to the four tissue types, right? There's epithelial connective. Um, muscle and nervous, it's a connective tissue. It's the only one that's liquid. When you 
when you give blood, right, if you go to the doctor or if you donate blood, it's usually taken from the veins. Um, it's a procedure called venipuncture. And the common site is the median cubital vein, which we'll talk about in a couple of chapters when we look at some of the veins. Um, that's the vein that runs across the inside of your elbow. Veins are usually used for taking blood because they tend to be closer to the surface. They're more superficial. They have thinner walls and they have lower blood pressure than arteries. So arteries are always receiving blood from the heart. So when the heart squeezes, it goes right into an artery. So arteries have these thick walls to accommodate that pressure. And so because they have thick walls, it's harder to actually puncture the artery and take blood from it. Right? It's easier to puncture a vein. By the time the blood gets through arteries and is into the veins to come back to the body, it's got lower blood pressure. We're going to talk a lot about that when we get to the uh, blood vessels themselves. So we'll start with the plasma, right? I said the blood is separated. You can separate it into two kind of two groups or two buckets, plasma and formed elements. The plasma is the liquid part of the, of the blood. Um, this accounts for most of the volume of your body. Um, it contains mostly water. Right, your plasma is mostly made up of water, 92%. 7% plasma proteins, which are dissolved in the, in the liquid. And then the other solutes uh, make up about 1%. So those would be things like hormones, nutrients like glucose, um, gases like carbon dioxide. And those make up a really tiny amount of what's dissolved in the liquid. Most of what's in your liquid part of your blood is water. There are three major types of plasma proteins, so these account for that 7%. Um, there are albumins, globulins, and fibrinogen. Albumins are the most common, and they are just maintaining osmotic pressure of your blood. So they're, um, they're helping to keep the fluid around the red blood cells kind of the same concentration as the fluid inside the red blood cells. If you think way back to when we talked about osmosis, Right, we talked about uh, red blood cells and you can have a solution that is um, hypotonic or hypertonic and the, the blood will flow either into or out of the cell. Albumins are outside the cell and they're making sure that that solution is isotonic, right? That it doesn't, uh, doesn't flow into the red blood cells, it doesn't flow out of the red blood cells. That's the main reason that albumins are there. Lobulins are um, mostly antibodies. Some of them are transport proteins, but a lot of them have to do with your immune system. The antibodies that you make are proteins and they are globulins. They're dissolved in the plasma. And then a, a small amount of the proteins dissolved in the plasma are fibrinogen. Um, fibrinogen functions in blood clotting, and we'll see how fibrinogen becomes uh, a strand of a thread-like strand called fibrin, which helps to clot the blood. So we'll talk about fibrinogen and fibrin in a little bit. Other things that are in the plasma, organic nutrients, so lipids, carbs, amino acids, vitamins, um, which are used for different things, for growth, for making energy, all that sort of thing. Uh, electrolytes. Electrolytes are just ions, so sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium chloride, bicarbonate sulfate. A lot of those have to do with, um, with, a lot of those are signaling molecules. They have to do with things getting in and out of the cell. So things like calcium and potassium and sodium are, are essential for cells to function normally, for you know, neurons to function and muscles to function and stuff like that. And then there are organic wastes like urea, ureic acid, creatinine, uh, bilirubin, ammonium ions, um, they are transported to sites of breakdown or excretion. So the blood either transports them to the liver where they get broken down, or it'll transport them to the kidneys where they can get transferred into the bladder and you can excrete them out. Okay. Those organic wastes are basically from eating certain foods. When you eat something that's you know made of protein, for example, you break it down, you use the amino acids that you can, but some of that becomes the waste product of urea or creatinine. 
and that, that gets excreted from your body. So then we say, so those, that's the plasma, that's the liquid part of the blood. The other part of the blood is the formed elements. And we've got red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Most of the formed elements are red blood cells, right? If you took any, if you took a drop of blood, like you just did, and you put it on a microscope slide, and you looked at it under a microscope, most of what you would see would be red blood cells. By far, you know, the, the very most things that you would see. They are responsible for transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, they are responsible for the red color of whole blood. Um, they actually contain a red pigment molecule called hemoglobin. So the red blood cells contain this pigment, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin binds to iron, which binds to oxygen. All right, so the whole, like, your blood isn't red until it hits ox oxygen is not true, right? That's not true. Okay, your, thank you. <laughs> your, blood, your blood's red. And the, and the blood in your veins is a little bit more of a purplish color, almost. It's like a little bit deeper red, and the blood in your arteries is, is brighter red, but they're, it's red. Yeah. I was always wondering if that was true or not. Yeah. No, it definitely is red. All right. <laughs> um, about one third of all the cells in the body are red blood cells. So you have a ton of red blood cells, right? They are measured as cells per microliter. So here's, you know, here are amounts that you have. I'm not interested in you, in you knowing what the normal amounts are. Um, a lot of times this is measured as a hematocrit. So a hematocrit is, um, is a test that's often used. I'm just seeing that, I'll show a picture of it. So a hematocrit is, is a test that's often used by doctors to see you know, and make sure you have the average amount of red blood cells, that you don't have a lot fewer or a lot more. Um, what they do is they take a, a blood sample, they take a sample of your blood, they put it in a tube, and they spin it in a machine called a centrifuge. And when you spin something really fast in a centrifuge, the heavier things that are in that tube will sink to the bottom. And so what happens is all the red blood cells kind of pack to the bottom of the tube. And they can literally measure how much of that tube is taken up by red blood cells. And from that, they can estimate, okay, this is about how many red blood cells you have in your body, right? If we know how many, if we know you've got this much per this volume, they can, they can extrapolate how much you have in your entire body. Um, again, men usually have more red blood cells than women. It's just because men usually have more muscle, they have more mass than women. That's the only reason. So it's just on the average. The structure um, is such that it allows the red blood cells to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide efficiently. So they have this uh, biconcave shape. They look, like, they look like donuts, except that the middle's not gone. It's just kind of an indented area, right? The middle's not a hole all the way through it. And that allows for them to fit really well through the uh, capillaries, but it also allows them to pack a lot of oxygen to each blood cell. Right, so each blood cell can carry a lot of oxygen mo molecules. Um, once the, so the blood cells, as they're forming, they have organelles, but once they become mature, they really lose all their organelles. They don't have a nucleus, they don't have ribosomes, they don't have any of those things once they're fully mature because they're not, they're not doing anything except their, their biggest role is to bind to oxygen and carbon dioxide. And they just keep doing that over and over again. So they don't need to make new proteins. They don't need any, you know, ribosomes, any mitochondria, anything like that. Right. And there's an example of a red blood cell. So this first picture on the left, that's called a blood smear. That's literally because that's what you do. You smear it. You take a drop of blood, you put it on a microscope slide, you take a second microscope slide and you kind of stand it up and you drag it through that drop. And then you put a cover slip on it. Well, you stain it with something before you do that, but it's liter you're literally smearing the blood across the slide, and you look at that under a microscope, and all of these little circles that are on this slide, those are red blood cells. You'd be hard-pressed to find a white blood cell anywhere. You can find them every once in a while. You can see a few little dots over here. I don't know if you can see where my cursor is. There's a few dots between those red blood cells. Those are platelets. 
Okay, there's, there's one here, there's one up there, but I don't see any white blood cells in here. It's because you have so many red blood cells. Um, this is what a red blood cell looks like. This is a three-dimensional shape of a drawing of a red blood cell. And so they've taken a, um, a slice through this particular red blood cell and they've enlarged it over here. So you can see it kind of looks like a donut, except there's not a hole all the way through it. It's just kind of indented in the middle. Okay. So what's bound to the red blood cells? Well, hemoglobin so that they can bind to oxygen. Um, this accounts for over 95% of all red blood cell intracellular proteins. So like I said, they don't have a lot going on once they're mature. They don't make proteins. They don't have mitochondria. Um, they're basically just for carrying oxygen around. So they just bind to as many hemoglobins as they can to bind to as many oxygens as they can. Um, hemoglobin is actually composed of these four subunits, um, which I'm not, I'm not worried about you knowing. I should have deleted more of these slides. Um, the, the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin is fairly weak. Um, if you have high plasma oxygen, so you have a lot of oxygen just floating around in the liquid part of the blood, it causes the hemoglobin to keep binding more and more oxygen. If you don't have much plasma oxygen and you have a lot of CO2, the, the red blood cells will actually let go of oxygen and start binding up that CO2 to get rid of the CO2 that's in your plasma. I have a question. Sure. When, when I was about four years old, my family and I had carbon monoxide poisoning. Mm. And we woke up in the middle of the night and my dad knew what was going on and we went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I, the one distinct thing that I remember is them drawing blood from our wrists. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It you may know. have just been an easier, uh, easier place to draw the blood from. Okay, I didn't know um, if it was because of a specific, you know, vein or artery or. No, it it may have just been that the um the one in the elbow, the median cubital vein, may have been sometimes like like um it collapses, it's like flattened out, and they have a hard time sticking it. Um, okay. so that's probably the only reason. Um, I mean, that was traumatizing. What a horrible place to oh draw God. blood. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, I, and I've and i seen people, I mean, even uh, I think when my wife went in the hospital for the fir for our first child, um, they had to go into a risk because they couldn't, they couldn't get oh. a vein in their elbow. Um, I've since, I've never seen that since then. And I just remember that. And my mom confirmed that that is where they draw our blood. So I was wondering if there mm. was a reason for it. No, uh, other than they, they might have seen them real close to the surface and said yeah. that's easier vein to get than the one yeah. in your elbow. But just being that it was carbon monoxide, what were you mm, that's, that's right scary. Now. So, so yeah. we're talking about how hemoglobin binds to oxygen. Yeah, hemoglobin would rather bind to carbon monoxide than oxygen. Yeah, that's what, it has, what makes of it. Yeah, it binds to carbon monoxide much stronger. And so then the problem is you've got red blood cells circulating through your body, but they're not bringing oxygen anywhere in your body. They're carrying yeah. carbon monoxide, um, wow. which is why you know why that's a scary thing. Um, usually they put they put you like in a, in a room or in a chamber that has a, a high amount of oxygen, right? To try yep. to saturate your blood with oxygen. We um, had the, the, in our nose. Cause I remember mm -hmm. I kept picking it out cause it stung. There was yep. like really little sure. like blips of, of memory from it. And that was mm -hmm. one of them as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a scary thing. Cause you can't, you know, you can't smell carbon dioxide or right. anything like that. It's just, I woke you, up in the middle of the night crying. I guess, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, Sounds horrible, but at least you. Uh, thankfully, you woke up. Well, now I know. I was always wondering why they took it out of our out of our wrist. You know, I didn't know if that was a reason. So, other no, that was no, the, other than that, just the yep. ease of you know ease yep. of getting to that vein. That's all. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, anemia is a condition that you hear a lot. You probably hear or know people that are anemic, or you are anemic. Um, it's just any reduction in the blood's oxygen carrying capacity. So most people have an, uh, an iron deficiency anemia, right? That's the most common thing. Because red blood cells bind to hemoglobin, hemoglobin binds to iron, iron binds to oxygen. So if you don't have enough iron, there's not enough oxygen bound to your red blood cells, you're not carrying as much oxygen around your body as you could, and you're using oxygen, remember, to make energy. So 
the symptoms of being anemic are that you get fatigued, you get tired easier, you get, you're weaker because you're not, you don't have enough oxygen to make energy that you need. But the term anemia, a lot of people associate that with just iron deficiency, but it's actually a term that means that your red blood cells are not carrying oxygen to their fullest capacity. So it could be just that you don't have as many red blood cells, right? There are, there are different reasons. You can be anemic, people that um, you know, get a bad injury and they bleed out a lot, they're anemic because they don't have as much blood going around. So there's all sorts of reasons that you can be anemic and just realize that anemia just means that you're not carrying enough oxygen or you're not carrying as much oxygen as you should be. So how long do these red blood cells last, right? We said that they don't, they kick out all the organelles and everything because they're basically their only role is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide around the body. Their lifespan is about 120 days. So that's about all that a red blood cell is good for. Um, so every day you're replacing about 1% of your red blood cells. You're making new red blood cells every day. Um, and about 3 million new red blood cells enter circulation every second, which is crazy to think about. Um, where are your red blood cells made? Who knows that? The red bone, bone marrow. marrow. Good, the red bone marrow, the, the center of your long bones is where new red blood cells are made. So every day you're making more and more red blood cells and every day you're taking old ones out of circulation and the old ones end up in your spleen, right? And they get taken apart and your body, your body's really good at uh, recycling and reusing uh, whatever, you know, whatever parts of the blood cells that it can. I have a question. Yeah. So what liver exactly do with the blood production? So the liver, along with the spleen, can take the old red blood cells out. And part of what it does is it pulls the hemoglobin off. And so if your liver is not working properly, a lot of people, um, you can get jaundice, right? A lot of babies are born jaundice. Um, it's a pigment because your liver is actually not doing what it's supposed to do with the, with the hemoglobin. Right, and that's why you end up turning yellow because you're not, you don't have enough hemoglobin circulating through your body to give you that pink color. Um, that's really the liver's only role in, in the red blood cells. Now what the liver's major role is, is in your digestive system. When we get to the digestive system, we'll talk about it more, but um, the basics are that when you eat or drink anything, it gets into your blood, right? But it gets to your, intestines and it gets absorbed into your blood good or bad doesn't matter what it is and so it's not always a great idea to just return that blood back to your heart right you can ingest things that are toxins and things like that and so what happens is that blood that comes from your intestines goes through your liver and gets filtered by your liver and then the quote-unquote clean blood gets sent to your heart so that's your liver's major role um, like I said, the liver does take out some of the old red blood cells and pulls the parts apart to recycle them. You can live without a spleen. Um, I know people that have had their spleens removed. You can live without a spleen, but the spleen is normally what would do most of that work. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a question about um, iron in blood. Yep. I was reading that on average men have more iron than women in their blood. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know if, if anybody knows. I don't know if it's a, a hormonal thing. I don't know if it's, again, just some of these things are just based on average body size, right? That the fact that on average men have more blood volume and more red blood cells because on average men have more muscle mass than women and have to provide oxygen to more muscle mass than women. Um, Maybe it's so it could just be something like that. What's that? I wonder if it has anything to do with menstruation for women. So I, it could be, yep, it could be, because you definitely lose, um, right. you know, you become slightly anemic yep. every, every time you menstruate um, because you're so losing- it's like accounted for or something, yeah. Right, it could be. It's definitely true that, that uh, there are more women that have iron deficiencies than men. 
but I mean, the problem with the problem with any studies involving people is that it's it's so there's so many variables, right? It's so hard to say whether it's due to diet or due to you know what I mean, due to this or that. Like it's it's just it's so hard to say. Yeah, for the like gendered stuff, I'm always really interested in why because mm -hmm. I was assigned female at birth, but I've been on testosterone for two years. Uh -huh. So I'm always trying to figure out like where on that scale, like if it's a hormonal thing, like what column I would fall under. Right, right. And that, that would certainly be interesting to know too, right? Like, I don't know if you know what your iron levels were five years ago compared to what your iron levels are now. I don't know if you have those sorts of baselines or not, but that would be uh, really interesting to know those sorts of things, you know? Um, and, and I don't have an answer. I don't know if it's related to hormones. It could be related to um, testosterone and estrogen. I don't know. Um, three steps of hemoglobin recycling. Like I said, this is just the, the red blood cells that are, that are old, that are 120 days old. Your body pulls, pulls them apart, right, and reuses things like hemoglobin. This is where people, um, if their livers aren't functioning properly, they can become jaundice. Um, the, the hemoglobin's pulled apart. The remaining heme is converted to a green biliverdin, which is converted to an orange-yellow bilirubin. The liver absorbs that and releases it into the bile which gets released into your uh, digestive system um, to break down fats. But if your liver's not working properly, this bilirubin, this yellow colored pigment builds up, right? And that's why people who have jaundice look more yellow. It's because of the buildup of this bilirubin from, from the hemoglobin breakdown. So why are babies born jaundice a lot? I had two so, before. Yeah. Um, just because their liver isn't fully formed yet. So their liver may not be capable of, of converting this to bilirubin and then secreting the bilirubin to the, um, to the gallbladder. So in babies, especially babies that are premature, there's usually a lot of issues with the digestive system and with the respiratory system. And that's because a baby doesn't uh, when an embryo is in, in womb, in the mother's womb, the embryo isn't using its lungs to breathe, right? And the embryo is not using its digestive system. It's, it's getting food and nutrients from the mother and it's getting oxygen from the mother. Um, so those are kind of the last things to form. So especially when a baby is premature, sometimes those things aren't fully functioning yet, right? Sometimes Sometimes the baby's born and maybe the, you know, maybe that function of the liver secreting that bilirubin into the gallbladder isn't fully formed yet because the baby hasn't had to digest any fats. It hasn't had to digest lipids through its small intestine yet. So uh, that's, a, that's a common thing that, well, somewhat common thing that babies are born slightly jaundiced and yeah. um, doctors will monitor that for a little while and, and make sure that that goes away within an appropriate amount of time. And it was to put them in the sun was the biggest. Yeah, put them under a sun lamp, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vitamin D. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. So again, here are some causes of jaundice. Um, basically, it's it's that the bilirubin levels are are rising. So it could be that there's blocked bile ducts, right? That there's gallstones for some reason it's not getting from your liver to your gallbladder or failure of the liver to absorb the, ex the excess bilirubin or get it to your gallbladder. Um, so there's all kinds of things. Or it could be due to excessive red blood cell breakdown. All of a sudden, you know, your liver is breaking down more red blood cells than it should, and you end up with more of that bilirubin than you, than you can secrete into your gallbladder. I have a question. Um, sure. So what is the relationship between bilirubin and... Uh vitamin B12 deficiency that caused um, jaundice? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know the relationship between that vitamin because I don't, I don't know enough about what some of these vitamins do. I wish I knew a little bit more about nutrition. I don't know a lot about what some of the vitamins do. So I don't know that, but I, I'd be happy to you know, look that up and we can talk about it. I was reading about it and I said um, the you know, when intestines absorb vitamin B12 and then the bilirubin, you know, 
something to do with uh, Billy Rubin and the uh, red blood cells. And it's like, I can't grasp everything. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I don't know if B2, so is B12 associated with, um, with jaundice? If you take too much B12, you get, you end up jaundice or is that um, what it there's is? There's some, something related to um, jaundice. It's lacking of vitamin B12. Oh, a lack of vitamin B12. Lack of it. So, I mean, maybe it just speeds up the, the process of the liver being able to excrete that bilirubin into the gallbladder. That I'm not sure about. Right. You know, I'm not sure what, what B12's role is in that. Right. I've tried to figure out. <laughs> My sister did a little research on um, B12 because it's part of our, this diet weight loss thing that we're a part of. And B12 actually helps also keep weight loss down. Like it helps you keep weight off, but I don't know how that would relate to this. Hmm. I mean, it could. Um, so if it promotes the excretion of bilirubin from the liver to the gallbladder, then you would have more bile, which would help you break down more fat. Could okay. have something to do with that. I don't know. Okay. Could have something to do with that whole pathway. I don't know. There's all kinds of, yeah, there's all kinds of things about vitamins that are really not well understood, I think, too. I have a quick question that might be related to sure. that question, but it's actually about the Billy Veridin and Billy Rubin. Like, mm -hmm. does, the, does the liver also use those substances as like a flushing out of toxins? And this might be more digestive um, focused, but because it's all connected, like, in addition to this recycling, mm -hmm. does it also create like an abundance of bilirubin to, you know, like if you eat something that, you know, say there was like, I don't know, something that your body recognized, like a pathogen or something, and it needed to just get it out. Like, does it also use bilirubin in that way to like flush the system of no. toxins? Okay. No. And actually most of those, um, most of the stuff you see about detox, you know, and, and detoxifying your intestines and stuff, most of that's untrue. Most of that, your the lining, the cells that line your intestines are shed every day. And so there's not any buildup of anything. Um, you, those detox things are, are basically a myth. And uh, you have to be careful that you don't end up getting dehydrated on some of those things. Um, but um, yeah, most most of the time that that's most of the time that's not found to be true at all. So I don't know I don't know of any um, reason that your body would kind of produce more of that to detoxify things. Your body has um, a lot of things in place in case you ingest a toxin, mm -hmm. um, including you know having including vomiting and diarrhea to try to get that toxin out of your body. Um, so I, I don't think so. I don't know of any cases where that happens. Okay. What I didn't mean ingesting any sort of like um, dietary things or detox things. I meant like if you ate something that made you sick, but that's helpful what you just said. So I think I understand. Yeah, I, there, there are um, things in place, but it's not related to Billy Rubin, right? There's, okay. there's okay. right. Your immune system will, will try to get rid of stuff, any kind of toxins that it sees, um, but it's not related to Billy Rubin. Okay, it's probably more like bile or something else with the digestive. Right, I mean, there, there's, like I said, that the um, blood from the digestive system goes through your liver and your, um, your liver detoxifies that blood before it goes back to your heart. And so that's, that's kind of the biggest thing with getting rid of toxins is that your liver is working appropriately. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Right, I found what I'm looking for. It's called the pernicious anemia, mm -hmm. which... Something to do with the red blood cells or iron, apparently. Okay. And vitamin B12. Okay. So, so what's so B12 promotes promotes the blood cells to last longer, to be more efficient, it's, or uh, it's something to do with the uh, uh, hold on production of the red uh, bone marrow it uh, requires vitamin b12 absorption okay so as long as you have enough b12 you're making 
you're making a lot of new red blood cells. Guess that's <laughs> let's see. Pernicious. And the pernicious pernicious anemia is something related to um to that lack of B12. Okay. That's what I'm trying to figure out. What is yeah. Like you have healthy red blood cells, but it doesn't have enough B12. Oh, no, cancel this. Come on. I just started this. All right, pernicious anemia. People who have pernicious anemia can't absorb the B12 from their food. So most of us get plenty of B12 from our food. Um, and so what happens, I believe, is that you are not making enough healthy red blood cells. Without enough B12, your red blood cells don't divide normally and are too large. And they may have trouble getting out of the bone marrow. Without enough red blood cells to carry oxygen, you may feel tired or weak. So that's pernicious. So you're saying, Lack of B12 and having pernicious anemia can also cause you to be jaundiced. So my guess would be that because the red blood cells you're making are not, um, they don't divide normally and they're too large. They're not actually carrying oxygen around your body. They're getting sent to your liver for breakdown. And so then your liver has an excess of hemoglobin that it's trying to break down, which results in an excess of bilirubin, um, which gives you jaundice. That would be my guess. So I have this and I get infections every month. Really? And they, yep. And they suspect that it is something to do with when I had mono severely. I'm realizing as I'm bringing up samples, like how much has happened to me in my life, you know, carbon monoxide, mono. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, they think that it might have something to do with when I had mono when I was 13. Mm -hmm. Nobody diagnosed me with it, so my pancreas was very inflamed, and I was really sick for like six months. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know what the connection is with that, but that's what my doctor suspected anyway. Yeah, um, mono definitely affects your spleen too. It makes your spleen. Um, the people that I know that have had their spleen removed, it's because it's uh, it ends up being inflamed because of mono. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if your spleen's not working correctly, then you end up you know, you, you can't get rid of the, the red blood cells as easily. And so you end up with more red blood cells building up that are old, that need to be taken out of circulation. And it's just, it's a big, it's a nasty cycle. And there are a lot of different, um, there are several conditions that are linked to having mono when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, I thought know, I was depressed. I, I really did. Like, that's what I was going, for. I just had no energy. And then mm -hmm. it was anemia. And then this is, that's what they discovered was the B12 deficiency. Right, yeah. right. Which, which, I mean, it's all related, right? I mean, yep. the, yep. the B12 deficiency leads to anemia, which leads to less oxygen, right. which leads to you being more fatigued and tired. So fatigued, yeah. Yeah, and so, I just yeah. suspected it's, that, and they were putting me on antidepressants and it wasn't working. So I was really lucky to be diagnosed correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it is a hard thing to diagnose. It's oh, not like there's yeah. one thing they can search for in your blood and find it, you know? Right, right. Yep. Um, this slide gets to a little bit of what River was asking about, where uh, men have more iron than women. Again, I, I always assume when, when you see stats like that, I always assume that it's just because of the average size of a male is, is larger than the average size of a female. So men have a, a larger need for oxygen requirements to feed muscles because they have more muscle mass. I did a Google and I figured out why. Okay. What, it's is, because... Is that <laughs> Well, that's kind of it. It's okay. because um, men, since they're larger, eat more food. And because um, since women are menstruating and pregnancy, you also lose a lot of iron. So on average, I think it's like women lose double the amount of iron daily than men do. So that makes sense. So that was, somebody else said that too, right? That probably uh, has something to do with menstruation too. So the, the fact that you're gaining less iron from the food and you're losing more iron because you're losing blood. I mean, those two things are going to give you on average 
a, a lower amount of iron, excuse me, in the body. Makes sense. Um, red blood cell formation is called erythropoiesis um, in adults that occurs in the red bone marrow, right? Oh, here's pernicious anemia. Requires amino acids, iron, and vitamins like vitamin B12. Um, if you have a deficiency in B12, it gives you pernicious anemia, which we just talked about. Do you guys know what um, EPO is? EPOPOETIN? Have you ever heard of that? Maybe you've heard of um, like some of the cycling uh, pro cyclists are doping or blood doping, right? Lance Armstrong was doping. What they're doing is there is a there's a hormone that your kidney makes that causes you to make more red blood cells, okay? And it makes sense because your kidney is actually monitoring how much oxygen you have. So if you don't have enough oxygen, your body makes more red blood cells in response because your body says, okay, well, if we have more red blood cells going around, we can carry more oxygen. This is why people go to a high altitude to train a lot of times for a fight, or for a race, right? If you go up high in the mountains, is, it, is there more oxygen or less oxygen? Less. Less, right? So if you're in an, in an environment where there's less oxygen, your kidneys are going to sense that there's less oxygen. They're going to send this hormone to your bone marrow to make more red blood cells so you can have more oxygen. So the thought behind training at a high altitude is that when you come back down closer to sea level for your fight or your race or whatever you're training for, that you'll have more red blood cells, therefore you'll be able to carry more oxygen around, you'll have more endurance. Same, so that goes to you know, any endurance sport, marathon running, uh, distance cycling, all that sort of thing. So then what happens is there's a synthetic hormone called epopoietin, right, or EPO-A, and it's for people that are, um, you know, severely sick that can't make their own red blood cells or can't make enough of them, and it stimulates red blood cell production. And so when you hear about somebody who's a cyclist doping on EPO, that's what they're doing. They're, they're taking this drug, this synthetic hormone, and they're using it to boost their red blood cell numbers, right? So somebody like Lance Armstrong, He's not interested in taking like testosterone or growth hormone to try to get bigger. He doesn't want more muscle mass. He wants more endurance. So he takes EPO A and he gets more red blood cells. Therefore, he should have more endurance than the guys that are riding around him, right? Because he has more red blood cells carrying more oxygen. So that's, that's the whole thing with blood doping. When you hear about blood doping scandals, that's what they're doing. It's not that they're taking steroids to try to get more muscle mass. They're actually trying to gain more red blood cells so they can carry more oxygen around their body. The is there is, any, I'm sorry, is there no. any disadvantage of that? It's like um, when your blood get, you know, when you have so much red blood cells, it gets thicker and harder for the heart to pump? Exactly. Yes, that's, that's the exact thing. You have more more red blood cells, it becomes more viscous, becomes thicker. Mm -hmm. It's harder to get that around your body, through your arteries, all that sort of thing. So that's exactly what the, what the downfall, the downside to that is. Okay, thank you. And so here are the stages in red blood cell maturation. Remember, when a red blood cell is fully mature, it doesn't have a nucleus, it doesn't have any of those organelles or anything like that. So here you can see Right in this chart, here's the bone. So they're talking about the bone marrow. You have these stem cells in the bone marrow. And these stem cells can either go to myeloid stem cells or lymphoid stem cells, and then can differentiate further. So first of all, what are stem cells? Right, you probably hear a lot about stem cells in the news. What are stem cells? Who knows what they are? Something to do with genetics, right? Yeah, so, so stem cells are cells that haven't gotten all the signals to become what they need to be yet, mm -hmm. right? When, you, when fertilization happens, egg meets sperm, fertilization happens, you've got one cell which divides to become two, four, 16, right? Keeps going and going and going, eventually becomes an embryo. 
when that is only you know 32 cells or 64 cells those cells are not muscle cells or nervous cells or bone cells they haven't gotten the signals to become anything yet they're just cells those are stem cells stem cells haven't gotten the signal yet to become what they will be when they're mature so these cells in this slide these are called hemohematopoietic stem cells meaning that they're going to become blood cells but they haven't gotten all the signals to tell them whether they're going to be a red blood cell or one of the different types of white blood cells or platelet right they're going to be some formed element of the blood so the reason that people are so interested in stem cells is that if you could take if you could take a cell and you could add the right signals you could give it the right signals to become what you need it to become you can do almost anything with it right think about somebody who needs let's say a liver transplant if you could take cells from somewhere else in their body and inject them into the liver and give them the right signals to become new liver cells they wouldn't need a liver transplant right you wouldn't have the the transplant list and trying to find a donor that's a match and all that sort of thing so that's why people are so interested in stem cells that's what the ultimate goal is the ultimate goal is to be able to take something like a skin cell which doesn't hurt at all to take some skin cells from somebody and to undo the signals that made them stem skin cells right to, to use in a lab basically undo those signals so they become stem cells and then give them a different set of signals to become liver cells or lung cells or heart cells or whatever you need them to be right that's the ultimate goal um i heard those people are saving umbilical cord mm -hmm. they said there's some stem cells on them like freeze them is that true it is there's not that many but there's some so a big part of the ethical considerations with stem cells was that for a long time researchers could only get true stem cells from embryos they're called embryonic stem cells and that has to be from embryos that are um, designated for destruction right designated to be aborted and so there's a lot of ethical considerations with that right there's a whole i'm not going to get into that there's a whole you know debate as to as to how ethical that is so there was um there were a lot of researchers that wanted to work on stem cells that couldn't for a long time and so part of the good that came out of that was that a lot of researchers found other ways to find stem cells right so if fine if, if you can't get stem cells from an aborted fetus because that's that's a really tough way to get cells um can we can we undo signals right can we take fully mature cells and undo signals to become stem cells and then push them in the direction we want them to go and you know the answer is sometimes not not completely not totally but you can get some cells from umbilical cord blood for instance right a lot of um some women are having their umbilical cord blood frozen and saved um, and banked because if that baby ends up needing a transplant later in life maybe there's something that can be done with those stem cells um, one of the places you can get stem cells and they can only turn them into certain cell types is from the bone marrow from um, like your femur for instance your femur has a lot of bone marrow um, so they take a huge needle and they go into your femur and they can they can get stem cells that way um, so these stem cells have been given some signals right they're going to become blood cells but they haven't been given all of the signals to become a certain type of blood cell yet and that's that's what stem cells are so when you when you hear about scientists uh studying stem cells that's that's the ultimate goal because here's the other thing right if if i'm on a transplant list for a liver i have to wait until there's a match i have to wait until there's somebody who has very similar markers on the outside of their liver cells that as i do so that my body doesn't reject it if i could go to a lab somewhere and they could take my own cells and grow them into a liver then there's no issue of rejection right those are my own cells they, they'll have all my own markers my immune system won't reject that right so that's that's another big consideration when why of why people are trying to do this and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that stem cell therapy really really works well um, there are a lot of people that have received you know stem cells for different conditions and have done really well with them and scientists don't quite understand 
if you put the stem cells with other mature cells, there's something that the mature cells do to tell the stem cells what to become. But scientists don't really understand exactly what's going on there. Um, so there is risk involved. But that's the ultimate goal, and that's why you hear so much about stem cells. <clears throat> so in this diagram, you can see that these stem cells from the bone marrow can become blood cells. If they become uh, myeloid stem cells, so if they get one certain signal, they can go down this pathway to become red blood cells or platelets or four of the different types of white blood cells. This fifth type of white blood cells, they have to get a different signal to become a lymphoid, uh, a lymphocyte, which are from a lymphoid stem cell. So this pathway is a little bit different, whereas these four pathways start off the same and then they kind of, they branch from there. Right. And then this is um, regulation of red blood cell production. So this is what I talked about with the kidneys. They um, tend to produce, not tend to, they send a, a hormone called the erythropoietin that triggers um, and triggers the, the bone marrow to make more red blood cells when there's low oxygen. Okay, so here again is stimulus of erythropoiesis, right? The stimulus is decreasing oxygen. Kidneys recognize it. They send out EPO. Your stem cells make more red blood cells. So you have more red blood cells, therefore your oxygen level goes up, right? And that, that restores homeostasis. All right, now we're gonna get to blood typing. So while we're on red blood cells, on the surface of red blood cells and on the surface of most of your cells, there are these markers called antigens. Antigens are like little flags, little markers on the outside of the cell. They're, they are there to let your immune system know what that cell is, right? Let other cells in the body know what's going on. In your red blood cells or on your red blood cells, you can have the type A antigen, you can have the type B antigen, you can have red blood cells that have both the type A and the type B antigens, or you can have red blood cells with no antigens. This is only for red blood cells. So, if you have the type A antigen, which I have, I have type A blood, my immune system knows to leave those cells alone, right? My immune system says, okay, we're gonna see this type A antigen on your blood cells, leave that alone. But if, you're, if my immune system sees any red blood cells with the B antigen, it's going to attack them. Right? So my immune system makes type B antibodies. It makes antibodies against type B. If you have type B blood, you make antibodies against type A. Right? Again, your immune system knows your blood cells have type B, have the B antigen on them. If you have type AB blood, then your immune system does not make antibodies against the A or the B, right? because it would attack your own blood cells. If you have the type O antigen, which is, just means you don't have A or B, then your immune system makes the type A antibody and the type B antibody. Now, this explains why donations can happen the way they can, right? I am type A. I can, get, I can receive blood from somebody else who's type A because my body won't attack the A antigen. I cannot receive blood from somebody who's type B because my antibodies will attack it. The same thing with type AB, I can't receive that, right? It's got Bs on it and I make the antibody against those. I can't do that. I can receive type O, right? O can, can donate to any of these because O doesn't have any antigens. It's not going to trigger any reaction. That's why O is considered the universal donor. But if you had type O blood, you can only receive from type O people, right? If you receive from any of these others, you have, you're going to have your antibodies or your immune system reacting to those antigens. So even though type O is the universal donor, they can only receive from type O. 
the opposite of that is type AB, right? They are the universal recipients, meaning they can't donate to anybody except for AB, right? They can't donate to type B, they can't donate to type A, they can't donate to type O. But they can receive blood from anybody because they're not making any of these antibodies, right? So type AB is actually one of the rarest blood types around. Um, but people who are AB can receive blood from anybody, in theory. So when you're saying that, like, for example, if you were A, obviously your body would attack B or AB if it noticed that. Can the body accidentally make another type of blood cell, or can it really forever only make the type that you are? It can only make the type that you are, as far as we understand it. Okay. So the only instance when this would be the case would be like transfusion. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. Like if you were in a, you know, a horrible accident or something like that, you had to go to the hospital and get a transfusion, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of times if you, if you're having elective surgery, I know people that have had elective surgery and they usually donate blood ahead of time, right? So that it's their own blood that's being used if they need a transfusion. Um, so yeah, it's usually just a, a transfusion. Um, so hospitals like to have type O blood, right? Oops, sorry. Hospitals like to have type O blood because again, in an emergency room, a lot of times you don't know what blood type somebody is, but you have to make a quick decision and give them blood, right? And, and type O will usually work. Now I say usually because those markers are not the only markers. There's something like 400 different markers on the outside of blood cells. So we use the A's, the B's, and the you know O's, A, B, and O. Um, we use that as kind of the first line of, you know, thinking about this. But there are other markers on blood cells. So in other words, just because somebody has, I'm type A, and if I'm given type A blood from somebody else, there could be one of those other markers that trigger some unforeseen reaction. Um, so then we get into positive and negative, right? We have to add on top of this. So we know that you can be any one of these four types. You can be positive or negative, which, which gives you eight types, really. Positive or negative is just based on a factor called the RH factor. All it means is that if, for instance, I am type A positive, that means that not only do I have A antigens, but I have RH antigens. Right? That's why I'm positive. If I did not have the RH antigens, I would be A negative. That's all it means. Okay, so it's just a second antigen. It's a second out of the 400 or whatever that are on red blood cells um, that, that is used, right? So they use the A's, the B's, the A's and the B's, and then they go to the pluses and minuses right afterwards. Um, so you can be A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, A B positive, A B negative, O positive, O negative. The RH. Question. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, go ahead. So speaking of the RH, so technically the um, O negative is the universal donor. Can, can that donate to type O positive, but cannot accept any blood except type O negative? Exactly. Exactly. So if you... If you have the RH factor, if you're RH positive, that means you won't make an antibody against the RH factor, right? I'm A positive. So I make antibodies against Bs. I don't make antibodies against As or the RH factor, right? Because I have it on my blood. If I was A negative, I would make antibodies against B and against RH factor. So if somebody else is A negative, I can't donate my blood to them because I have the RH factor, their body's going to attack my blood, right? Their immune system is going to attack my blood because their immune system isn't used to seeing that RH factor. Um, so exactly what Juliet said is right, type O negative is really the universal donor, right? Because if you gave O positive blood to somebody who's O negative, that O negative person would reject their blood, right? But if you give O negative blood, to somebody that's O positive, there won't be any issues. This 
the classic textbook example of this is something called erythroblast erythroblastosis fetalis. It has to do with when a woman gets pregnant. So if you are an RH negative female, then your body is not used to seeing the RH factor. If you get pregnant by a man who has RH positive blood, there's a 50-50 chance that your embryo, right, that your baby is going to be RH positive, right? 50-50 chance they could get the gene from you or the gene from their father. So there's a chance that you could be an RH negative woman and have an RH positive embryo. Now, your body does not make antibodies until it sees a reason to. So if you're an RH negative woman, you don't necessarily have antibodies for the RH factor until you see the RH factor, like until, until your immune system sees that somewhere. So during a pregnancy, especially during the first pregnancy, the, the mother's blood and the embryo's blood usually don't mix. That usually doesn't happen until childbirth. Okay, that's when the, when the blood mixes. And so at that point, so a woman who's RH negative could have an embryo that's RH positive and could give birth and the embryo could be fine. But at that point when she gives birth is generally when the blood mixes, okay? At that point, the woman's body is going to be exposed to the RH positive blood. And her body is going to start making antibodies, RH antibodies. So now that woman is RH negative and has RH antibodies because she's been exposed to that blood. If that woman then gets pregnant a second time, by a man that's RH positive, right? Now she has the antibodies in her body. So now what's going to happen if that, if that embryo is RH positive is her immune system is going to attack that embryo. Um, and in most cases, the embryo won't live, okay? And so it's, it's really only, it's the second pregnancy that becomes the, the biggest issue um, and every subsequent one thereafter. But, you know, the first pregnancy, a lot of times, because the blood doesn't mix unless there's, you know, unless there's complications. Um, the first pregnancy, usually the woman is not making the RH antibody. And so it, it you know, the first pregnancy, the, the baby can be born. Um, with the second pregnancy, it almost always will attack the, the embryo. Um, like I said, when a woman is pregnant and goes to a doctor, right, to verify that she's pregnant, if she is RH negative, they give her a shot of Rogam right then. Rogam is RHO, right? And that's because the RH factor. Rogam, what it is going to do is bind to any RH antibodies that are made. So in other words, if the woman is making RH antibodies, they're all going to bind to this Rogam that's getting injected. They're not going to bind to the baby's blood, the embryo's blood. Um, Usually the shot is given, I believe, at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the pregnancy. I think it's usually three times during a pregnancy that it's given. And again, the reason for it is it's kind of a, a distraction, right? It's kind of, it's going to bind to all the RH antibody that's there so that the RH antibody doesn't bind to the embryo's blood. Okay, and that's, like I said, they don't care if, you know, if you're an RH negative woman and you say, well, I know the father is... RH negative as well, they don't care. Like, they're not going to take that risk. You know, um, if you're RH negative, you're getting Rogam. That's it. Um, I didn't have to go through this. My, my wife is RH positive. She's, she's actually AB positive, which is crazy. Um, so she's lucky. We didn't have to go through any of that. But, you know, that's the reason that uh, pregnant women get Rogam shots is because of that RH factor. Questions about that? Because that's usually a little bit um, convoluted, kind of hard to understand sometimes. Would the result be a miscarriage? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because you said it wasn't until delivery, but I didn't know if. if so the, the, right, the mixing of the. 
So basically the whole time that the, the embryo is in the womb, it's, it's getting our blood. Yeah. A woman, the blood, it's right? It's getting from the, the immune, it's getting the immune system from the mother. Right. Right. So even though it's starting to make its own blood cells, the mother's immune system are what are, you know, keeping that, that embryo healthy. And so during the first and pregnancy, the, system, the mother's immune system doesn't have the antibodies yet to do anything bad to the blood. Mm -hmm. But then during the second pregnancy, once the embryo starts making blood, the mother's immune system is going to attack that blood. Okay. <coughs> so if this happened like in a second pregnancy example and someone didn't know anything about this, wasn't told about it, and then they got pregnant a third time after like a miscarriage for the second one, like mm -hmm. you're... So it could be a 50-50 chance that, like, they still may never know about this in the third pregnancy might go along just fine if, if the chance happened that the embryo had the matching blood type, so this didn't occur. Right, exactly. So the, in your example, the, the third child, if the third embryo got the Rh factor from the mother, mm -hmm. right, that third embryo would be Rh negative, and the mother's immune system would never attack it, and... The woman, you know, like you said, might have a, a healthy pregnancy and just had that one miscarriage and, and doesn't necessarily know why. Um, mm -hmm. That could certainly happen. Wow. So this probably attributes to like a lot of miscarriage and, um, and people might I not don't, know about it. I don't know how much. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much, especially in other countries. I don't know how much. Uh, it's hard to say how many females don't go to a doctor when they find out that they're pregnant. Right. Mm -hmm. or, or at some point, right, when they're pregnant. Um, probably my guess would be that it happens more in other countries where it's more of a third world situation um, where people have much less access to health care than we have. Um, but even our health care system is all screwed up. Right. It's not it's not good. That's for sure. But I think um, any any time somebody is pregnant and goes to a doctor, the first thing they do is look at that that woman's blood type. And if it's Rh negative, She's getting Rogam, whether mm. she wants it or not, really. <laughs> wow. What does Rogam do? Is there any side effects for the mother after getting a Rogam injection? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's side effects to everything, but it because it just... Like it actually doesn't target any of the tissues in the mother or anything like that. It's it's just it's just a molecule that the Rh antibody will recognize and bind to. So there so might that, be like an immune binding response to or the blood cells of the embryo. It's binding to this thing that's injected. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's not necessarily like it's not it's not necessarily affecting anything in the mother's body. You know what I mean? It's just kind of a false a false thing, like a decoy that. The, the antibodies bind to rather than binding to their their target of the blood cells. For the first pregnancy at birth at that time when the blood mixes, can that also be like a potential issue point or fatal point? I think this happened to someone in my family like a couple generations ago and they didn't know about the blood type issue until it was like first pregnancy, the baby was being born and there needed to be like a transfusion like immediately. But maybe that was, and I thought I think it was about a blood type thing in the end that they realized. It it could be certainly, especially if there were complications and there was you know more blood than, um, than an average birth certainly. So. Here's what we did, and here's why this kind of gets confusing, right? What we did for the lab part today was we did blood typing. So I have type A blood, which means that in my body, I have type B antibodies. What we looked at today at the beginning of class today is only what your blood is, not what's in your immune system. So you took your blood and you put it on this card. And on that card were already antibodies for A in the first circle, antibodies for B in the second circle, antibodies for the Rh factor in the third circle. Those were already there. 
those were put there. They were manufactured outside of your body. They're not from anybody's immune system. Okay. Then you took a few drops of your blood, right? And you put a drop in each of those circles. And you looked for agglutination, right? You looked for clumping. If you saw clumping, that meant that you had that blood type. So if you saw clumping in the first circle, that meant that you have type A blood because your blood reacted with the antibody on that card. Okay? But in your body, you don't have that antibody. In your body, you have the B antibody. In your body, if you had that antibody, it would clump up, right? And it would, you'd have that going on inside your blood vessels, which is not good. You don't want clumping to happen inside your blood vessels, right? So the, the reason this gets confused oftentimes is that students are thinking, well, if I have type A, don't I have the B antibody? The, the answer is yes, you do. But that's not what you were looking at on the card, right? And that's where it gets confused. So I think I wanna just leave it at that for today. Um, what we'll do is we'll start tomorrow, we'll talk about the, the white blood cells because there are um, five different types of white blood cells. We'll talk about those and they'll talk about the platelets and what they do and their role in, uh, in blood clotting. But what kind of questions do you guys have for me? I just have a question about the homework. Mm -hmm. I was looking at it today and I saw that it's not due until next week. Is that true since we're covering? Right. Since, since we're covering, since we're taking like a couple of weeks to cover all this cardiovascular stuff. Absolutely. So it's, it's going to be not going to be due for, it's going to be a week extra to do the homework. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. The test is due Friday. The, right. The exam. The exam. I thought it was due already. It's due today. That's what it's I thought. It's due today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the, and the reason for that was that I'm trying to get you to push all that aside. And now we're like, now we're moving on to the blood, which is a whole bunch of other things too. Um, so it's not to necessarily penalize you guys or anything. I'm just trying to, you know, do it so we can compartmentalize. You can say, okay, now I'm done with the nervous system stuff for now. And, you know, moving on to the blood, the blood and the cardiovascular system. What is the lab that we have to do for this? I know, noticed on Moodle there was like a, I didn't really go through all that stuff oh, yet. But. So on Moodle, I posted two things. I posted a, a PDF, which just talks about mm -hmm. blood typing, right? It just talks about the stuff we talked about today, about what the, what the card is and what the antibodies are and agglutination and all that sort of thing. And then there's a case study. It's just one question. It's just a question about, um, you know, uh, some EMTs that gave a blood transfusion and, and this reaction happened. And what do you what do you think? What do you suppose happened? What do you think? You know, did the EMT make a mistake? And what could the mistake have been? And why do you know that? That's that's all it is. Um, it's just one question. So, yeah, if you guys could answer that, um, I don't think I made it due until next week. But yeah, if you could answer that based on what you know from today from blood typing and having to get, you know, the same type of blood. Otherwise you'd have a certain reaction. Um, that's all that that is. And then next week, what we're going to do is a heart dissection, which is really cool too. Um, so I wanted to get through this blood stuff and then next week we can do the heart dissection, which like I said, is cool. So hopefully tomorrow, my plan for tomorrow is to get through the rest of the blood and then to at least do a rudimentary drawing of um, of the heart and the blood flow through the heart so that you're starting to understand that so that next week when we do the heart dissection, you have some background to go on, right? And then we'll go through the, the chapter on the heart. I have a question. Do we have to take a picture of the blood and post it on Moodle? <clears throat> I would like you guys to. Yeah, I would like you guys to take a picture of the, the card that you had and just tell me what the blood type is. It should say on the card. You should have written that on the card. But yeah, and so I'll, I'll send out an email um, as soon as we get off this meeting to say, you know, please take a picture of your uh, blood typing card and, and just upload that. Just upload. You can take a picture with your phone and upload it as a JPEG. That's fine. Um, I messed up mine. <laughs> that's okay. As long as you know what it is. The biggest yes. thing is that if you're, you know, if you're given those four dots and you're given examples of, you know, 
agglutination in the first and the third, you can figure out what blood type that is, that kind of thing. Yeah, that I figure out. It's just, it's all messed up. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want us to attach that picture with the answer to the question for the last? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I need to be clear on that. So I'll send out an email clarifying that. Um, but it should, I'll double check, but it, um, it should let you attach like up to 20 documents or something. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be a limit in that. So it should be fine. I have a schedule question, just looking ahead a little bit. Sure. Um, where it says final exam on this last piece, is that an exam that's covering the last area, like lab 14, urinary system pathology? Is that for that one, or is it a culmination? Or um, Let me check. I don't think you have a cumulative exam, but let me make sure before I say that. I remember like way back you saying that you liked that it was broken into sections. So I didn't think we did. Um, that's, but then that's I flipped to the second page of the schedule and I saw it and I was like, oh, I didn't see that. It's like one line that says final exam. That's my thought too, but hold on. I, I, I'm just opening that right now. I think, um, I think you're right. I think, right. So the final exam will just be exam six the digestion and respiratory system yeah yeah you'll have six exams you won't have a, a cumulative final okay i was going to ask that too but i thought you know it's just too early and i look at it <laughs> earlier and i feel like i'm having a heart attack with all it's like it's no. a combination of all chapters yeah no if it was in a class like this where you're going through so many chapters to do a cumulative final it's just gonna probably bring everybody's grade down and that that's there's no purpose in that there's no reason to do that so um yeah so it will just be six exams there won't be uh, nothing's cumulative okay thanks for clarifying yeah you're welcome and that question that you mentioned a little while ago for this assignment did you mm -hmm. say you're going to put that question in an email um it's it's already posted on moodle but i'll, I'll send out a, a course message to you guys um, saying, please respond to this and upload a picture of your uh, blood typing. Okay. Sorry, I missed that one. That's okay. This is a little early too, but do you um, teach AMP too? Because I was going to make an appointment with my <laughs> counselor soon. Um, or advisor, I guess it would be called. No. So, actually, I was asked to teach both this class again and Think, I think it was AMP2. I can't remember if it's AMP2 or AMP1. Well, that would um, be ideal. I didn't know if I could like request <laughs> you or something. <laughs> so certainly, look, I mean, they asked me to teach it and I accepted. Um, right. They asked me to teach it online, uh, two online classes next uh, fall. Um, so look for my name. I can't remember if it was AMP1 or AMP2. I think it was AMP2, but I can't remember for sure if it was. And can we opt to do it online even if they're back in person? How does that, work? that I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know how the school is working with that. Um, I did several times ask, you know, to make sure that this was online asynchronous, and okay. they keep telling me yes. The classes that we want you, to, you know, that we're asking you to teach are, um, yeah. but I don't know what the rules are. I know some colleges do, you know, some online no matter what. Um, like I teach at I teach at Capital Community College in Hartford, Connecticut, and they they do. They always have online classes. Even before COVID, they had, you know, a certain proportion of their classes were online because a lot of their students are, you know, working and have families and yep. have time constraints. So I don't know what Greenfield does. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully well, that'll work out. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys think of any questions, definitely email me and um, I will see you guys at three o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye guys. Bye.